shows we're live. <clears throat> Even though it says live video starting, but it shows we're live, so I know we're live. So I know you can hear me. So this is going to be for today's uh, daily bread reading, January 25th. The insight scripture is going to be Esther chapter 2, verses 3, 4, and then 1 through 17. That's supposed to be 12 through 17. I'd have a typo there. I started to say, I don't think that's 17 verses there. <laughs> so, yeah, it's supposed to be 12 through 17. And then we're going to be reading Exodus. Uh, really? That quick, I forgot. 13 and 14, I want to say. I don't remember it's getting it that far ahead. But 12 and 13, okay. And then uh, we'll be covering Matthew 16, which is not that very long. And so, with that, Father, we just thank you every day that we wake up, Father. And, and we know that after that, I saw a testimony today. And before I start praying, I want to share this testimony that I saw on, it was on a YouTube video. And the lady was at a church that she's been attending probably since she was a little girl, right? She's always attended this church. And she had left to go somewhere. I forgot where she said it's irrelevant. It's not pertinent to the story. And she said that she was just so, you know, thinking deep and thinking about where she was headed that when the people going straight got the green light, she was turning left, right? So when they got the green light, not even thinking, she just started turning left. And so when she started turning, she realized, and I guess the other traffic coming towards her had already had a green light or something because after soon she started turning, she realized that there was this vehicle that was getting ready to smash into her. So evidently this vehicle was going rather quickly. You know, it's not like it just took off. And so, you know, seconds before it hit her, she realized that this was going to be bad because it was going to broadside her on the passenger side. But nevertheless, it was going to be bad. And so as her truck is rolling, right, she's thinking, this is it. I'm getting ready to die. And she said the first thought that came to her mind is, I'm not ready. I wasn't ready, she said. And so she ends up upside down. And then, you know, within a, like seconds, she hears voices and someone asks her, do you have your seatbelt on? And she's like, yeah, my seatbelt's still on. And they said, can you feel your legs? And she's like, yes, I can feel my legs. And she said, and it was then, through the grace of God, she realized that she didn't receive any injuries from this being T-boned, right, and rolling in this vehicle. And she was unscathed. And she said she just started praising God in that car. And, I mean, she just started weeping at that moment. You know, she just started crying. And she, ooh, she told him, she said, Father, she says, you spared me. You know, I, I should have died. You know, she's thinking she should have died in that wreck because her car rolled so many times and it had beat that car up so bad that really she should have been dead. And she said if she would have died that day, she would have went to hell because she wasn't ready. She wasn't ready. And she says, but she told God, because you let me live, because you gave me another chance. She says, I'm going to go where you tell me to go. I'm going to say what you tell me to say and to whom you tell me to say it. I'm yours. My life is not mine. It's yours. And I'm going to use it however you tell me. And I mean, she was just, I mean, the spirit was all over her. And she was just weeping and just crying. And I'm, I'm just like bawling, listening to this testimony that she's telling. Because we never know when our time is going to come. And we have to truly ask ourselves, are we ready? If we were to die right now, if we were to walk out our front door and a car lose control and run up in our yard and hit us and kill us, are we truly ready? Are we truly, truly saved? Have we truly surrendered it all to Jesus and truly living for him, forsaking the world, being in the world, but not being part of the world? When the world looks at us, do they see Jesus in us or do they see the world? Are we sanctified and set apart? Can they see Jesus in us? You know, are we are we doing what God has called us to do? Are we sharing the gospel? Are we doing the great commission that Jesus called us to do? All of us are called to be evangelists to a certain extent. We're all to share the gospel with as many as we come across. Every person we speak to, we should ask them, 
do you know my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Do you have a few minutes to hear about him? Do you have a few minutes to hear about the man that saved me from my addictions that should have killed me? That he had a better plan for my life. And I've been spending that every minute I can ever since he spared me from killing myself with drugs to share him with everyone that I can. There's a song called Nobody and the lyrics and it's on a sign that I have that I use on my street ministry. It says, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. Time is short. There are there are well known evangelists and and people that have written many books and that are well-known preachers um actually i didn't even know this person's name it's max something but he's very well known evidently and he is now going around and using his popularity knowing his you know that because everyone knows who he is i didn't know him but a lot of people do and he's starting to then he and people like him are starting to say now that anyone that that talks about the pre-tribulation rapture that that's a doctrine straight from hell and that these people that are preaching or teaching or talking about pre-trib that they're just they're just teaching an, an escape theology that they're just thinking oh well the earth's going to go to hell anyway so i'm just going to kick back and sit back on my butt and just wait for jesus coming and rescue me out of this mess and i'm just going to let the earth go to hell they're all going to go to hell anyway and so he makes it sound like we're not doing anything not true but there is some truth to it this world would not be so bad if the church had been doing what jesus called us to do you know there's a lot of people that talk the talk but they can't walk the walk i don't know how many years now i've been begging asking people on facebook who will go with me out on the streets i just want one person just someone to go with me so i'm not out there by myself but i do it anyway I'm not scared. Worst thing they can do is kill this body and send me to be in to be in the presence of Almighty God. It's a win-win for me, right? But there's a lot of there's people that talk all this big talk about what a Christian they are and how faithful they are to God and how they do all these things. But I can't get anyone to go out on the street with me to minister to people. Or to even just hold a sign. I, I don't even talk to anyone. Just hold a sign that says, Jesus loves you. Have a blessed day. Or hand out Bible tracts, you know? Nothing. And, and, and so this, this is the kind of stuff that she was talking about. That she wasn't ready because she was living her life for her. She was doing what was comfortable for her. She went to church on Sunday and Wednesday and Easter and the holidays and she sang in the choir and and she taught children's church and she was a member she helped this and that and she in different ministries in the church and she did her weekly deeds you know at the church but that was it once she left the church that was it then she, it was her life her her thing she was doing her thing not necessarily going to the club or drinking or doing drugs or anything like that but she was ministering to those that were already saved you know, and God said, you know, Jesus said that if you love the world, the world will love its own. He even said, if you if you have if you throw a dinner party, don't invite the rich and those that can repay you. Go and invite the the poor and the lame and the blind and you know folks like that that can't repay you. In other words, we have a fellowship dinner at church where we have our potluck every month. We should be inviting folks to church that has that know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Those are the people he's saying invite. Those that need to know they have a Savior and that they have hope in this world. So we don't ever want to be in that position that she was in that day where she thought she was going to die. And she knew she wasn't ready. And she knew that if she had died that day, she would have been spending eternity in hell. But because God chose to deliver her that day, she promised God then in that car hanging upside down by her seatbelt that every moment she was alive and breathing, she was going to dedicate to serving him however he called her to serve him. And that's how we should all be because there is someone that did get on that cross and take the punishment 
from uh, the wrath of God upon himself for us and paid the sinner's death with his life for us. He did that for us. So our life isn't our own. And because he was willing to do that and give up his own life and suffer the worst death known to mankind so that we could have eternal life with the Father and he could pay the price of our sin debt in full and we could have eternal life and we could have forgiveness of our sins by believing on the one and only true begotten Son of God who was born of a virgin, lived the sinless life, died and rose again. Because of that fact right there, believing and trusting in God and knowing the truth and believing the gospel, that reason alone is why we should be dedicating everything we do for him. Everything we do, we should do unto the Lord. It's 1010. Amen. We don't need to be rescued or delivered from an auto accident that we should have died in. Jesus rescued us 2,000 years ago. Amen. Let's go ahead and get into our reading. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for what you do for us, have done for us, and continue to do for us, Father. You've, you've already given us the greatest gift, and that's eternal life with you through, through the sacrifice you made with your only begotten son. Your son, you became flesh. You became a man so that you yourself could die in our place. You chose to become a man and die on that cross to pay the debt that we deserved, the death, the suffering that we deserved. But you took it upon yourself through your son, the second person of the three person of the Godhead, to pay that price because you love us that much that you were willing to die for us, that you were willing to send your only begotten son to take our place so that we could have our relationship with you restored. Father, there's not enough time ever, not even eternity is not long enough to thank you for that. So as we get into your words tonight, Father, I just ask that you just let it just light us up. Just let the Holy Spirit just fill us full and just, Open our eyes and our ears and let us really, really understand what we're reading. Let it really sink down in us. Light the fire in us and, and renew the, our first love when we first met Jesus, when we first gave our life to him and we were just in love and ready to tell the whole world. Father, relight that in us. Give us that desire and that zeal again to get out there and tell everyone do you have a few minutes to hear about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Father, we know time is so short and time is almost up. And there's so many, Father, that are dying in their sins. And there's, there's so many that we could have talked to that we're not. So, Father, give us the tenacity to get off our pews and to get out there in the street, in the malls, in the theaters, wherever we have to go to talk to people and just speak. Plant the seed. We know that you'll water it and make it grow. But give us that desire, Father. As we read your word, let it get down on the deep inside of us and, and let it blossom and grow so that we have the discernment, the knowledge, the wisdom, and the understanding so we'll have the words to speak. We know the Holy Spirit will speak through us. But we also want to have the words ingested and digested and eaten and just in us and coming out of us, Lord so that we can share it with everyone we come across. And we pray that you put people in our path, Father, that need to hear the good news, that need to know, that needs to know that there is hope in this dark world. Because even though the world's getting darker, the darkness will never overcome the light. And we are the light of the world. We are the light on the hill. Jesus is the light of the world, but we're the salt and light of the earth. And we're the light on the hill to share the gospel to carry on the mission that Jesus started until he returns and father we pray this in your son's precious Jesus precious name amen so the scripture Esther we do have the the Jewish holiday Purim coming up and if you're familiar with the movie one night with the king and the story of Esther 
Purim is the holiday that they celebrate every year around March because it was the battle they fought after Esther went before the king unannounced, uninvited, risking her life. If I perish, I perish, right? Uh, and she went before the king and, and, and revealed to him what uh, uh, Haman had done, was doing. And so they were allowed to defend themselves. So after that battle, they were able to be su to successfully defend themselves. And so they celebrate Purim every year around March. And I put that in the description. Um, no, actually, I put it on, on. We'll see it here in a minute when I get to the reflect and pray part. And it and it tells you like when it's going to be for this year. And they they also uh, read the Book of Esther and celebrate the Purim. But I mean, I'm, I know that y'all aren't Jewish, but our Savior is, <laughs> you know. So I mean, I don't think it's a terrible thing to to be familiar with some of the Jewish holidays. Amen. Especially this one, because what Esther did saved her people, a lot of them, from being slaughtered. So let's go ahead and read. And let the king appoint officers in all the. Wait, did I not? What did I do? I didn't put the. Uh... Okay, here we go. Yeah, there's what I was looking for. I was starting to say I usually put like where they put like talk about what the scripture the inside scripture is about. I thought it was supposed to be there. Okay, so Esther chapter two verses three and four and then twelve through seventeen. In the Lord's hand, the king's heart is a stream of water that he channels toward all who please him, says Proverbs twenty one one. The book of Esther shows God doing exactly that. The villain Haman sought to destroy God's exiled people, Esther 3, 8 through 9. But God channeled the heart of the king to show favor to Esther and to her fellow Jewish citizens. Yet the book never mentions the name of God. Did you know that? Why is it in the Bible? Precisely because it shows the character and sovereignty of God, who loves his people even when they're far from him. And this was written by Tim Gustafson. So the scripture, Esther 2, verses 3, 4, and 1 through 17, 12 through 17, I have a typo there, read, And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan, the citadel, into the women's quarters under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given them. Then let the young women who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. Each young woman's turn came to go into King Exerxius, Exerxius, something like that, after she had completed 12 months preparation, according to the regulations for the women. For thus were the days of their preparation apportioned, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king, and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women, to the custody of uh, Sheashkaz, I don't know, the king's eunuch who kept the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. Now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, yeah, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Xerxes into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tibet in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. I love the, I love the story of Esther. I've watched the movie One Night with the King. I've watched the, the movie Esther on Pure Flicks, and there's another uh, Esther 
on YouTube. I have watched them probably, oh, I can't even tell you how many times. I love that story. Oh, I was going on the wrong thing. Okay. So the insight story for today is called Strange Places. And it says, God, why is this happening? Is this really your plan for us? As a husband and a dad of young women, the, those questions and more swirled in my mind as I wrestled with the serious cancer diagnosis. What's more, our family had just served with a missions team that had seen many children receive Jesus as their savior. God had been bringing forth evident fruit. There was so much joy. And now this? Esther likely poured out questions and prayers to God after she was plucked from a loving home and thrust into a strange new world, Esther 2, verse 8, that we just read. Her cousin Mordecai had raised her as his own daughter after she'd been orphaned, but then she was placed in a king's harem and eventually elevated to serve as his queen. Mordecai was understandably concerned about what was happening to Esther, but in time the two realized that God had called her to be in a place of great power for such a time as this, a place that allowed for her people to be saved from destruction, and that's in chapter 7 and 8. It's evident that God prevent, pro, providentially placed Esther in a in a strange place as part of his perfect plan. He did the same with me. As I endured a lengthy battle with cancer, I was privileged to share my faith with many, many patients and caregivers. What strange place has he led you to? Trust him, he's good, and so are his plans. Uh, Romans 11, 33 through 36. Uh, I wanna just close that so I can't even read that. This was written by uh, Tom felt it. Let me just grab my, my baby really quick and just see what that says. Yeah, I know it. I know it. I know what it's going to say. Oh, my gosh. I can't think of it, though. Uh, I know I'm going to know when I read it and I'm going to like want to kick myself. Uh, Romans was like Bishop Ron's favorite chapter. I mean, I think he had it memorized the whole thing. 33 through 36. Glasses right here. If I had better lighting, that would help immensely. Ah. ah, greatness of God. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Yeah. Wait, is this 12? No, okay. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Actually, I didn't know that one. So even though it is highlighted in yellow. So evidently they have taught on that verse before. Okay. And go. Thank you. So what has God led you to a strange place? And why can you trust in his perfect plans? <laughs> because God is perfect. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Amen. Father God, help us to trust you even when we don't understand what you're doing. Even though, I uh, see how the words in that song, uh, Waymaker, when, when I don't, really, I can't believe that the words just left me just like that. When I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't hear it, you're working. Right? Something like that. I forgot the words. It's been so long since we got to sing that song. And, of course, I don't have the lyrics in my other book. <sighs> Whatever. Anyway, yeah. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't hear it, you're working. Yeah, it's always. When nothing's happening, God's up to something. That's what I've always heard. And then it reiterates Esther 4.14, who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Uh, here's the Purim date, evening of Saturday, March 23rd through Sunday, March 24th. Now, if it's a leap year, they have it two days. Uh, in 2024, the festival of Purim will take place from the evening of March 23rd until the evening of March 24th, which their days are from evening to evening. In Jerusalem, where Shushan Purim is celebrated, the festival takes place on the following day from March 24th to March 25th. So, just 
thought I'd throw that in there since we're talking about Esther. So, anyway. Okay, so we're going to be reading Exodus 12 and 13. The Passover instituted. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. You, your lamb shall be without, pardon me, without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. So at the top of the door, or, uh, yeah, at the top of the doorpost and then on either side. Uh, do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now, one thing I want you to notice, he's going to look for the blood. He's not looking for who's inside the house and what they're doing and how they're doing and what, they, what they're thinking or whatever. He looks for the blood, just like today. God looks at us. He looks for the blood of his son on us. If he sees his son's blood on us, he looks at us as, as righteous only because of the blood of Jesus is on us. Amen. So when he sees the blood of the, of the slain lamb on their doorpost, that will make him pass on to the next door right so he's just looking at the blood he's not looking at what's on the inside he's just looking for the blood so this day shall so in other words there's nothing we can do there's nothing we can do that will make us righteous our righteousness is, is as filthy rags disgusting nasty right but if he sees the blood of Jesus on us he sees righteousness Jesus' righteousness on us. Anyways, verse 14. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day, there shall be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this same day, I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwellings, you shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourselves, according to your families, and kill the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through 
to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the door, two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come to, into your houses to strike you. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. It, shall, it will come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as he promised that you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? That you shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the children of Israel went away and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. The tenth plague, death of the firstborn. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he, all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. The Exodus. Then he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and article, uh, articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they granted them what they requested. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, or Succoth, however that's, I think it's Sukkoth, 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 something like that. About 600,000 men on foot, besides children. A mixed multitude went up with them also, and flocks and herds, a great deal of livestock, and they baked unleavened cakes of the dough, which they had brought out of Egypt. For it was not leavened, because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. Now the sojourn, now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years on that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night of solemn observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. That This is that night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout the generations. Passover regulations. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it, but every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. A sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. In one house it shall be eaten. You shall not carry out my stomach any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. And then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as a native of the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. Thus all the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded, Moses and Aaron. So they did. And it came to pass that on that, same, on that very same day that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their armies. I want to show you something real quick if you'll let me do it. Oh, my God, my stomach is cramping. Okay. So let me pick it up right here, and I want it to draw. 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 Okay. So on their doorposts, they put the blood here. And then on either side, right? So if you join these together, it makes a triangle, right? It's kind of hard to draw with the mouse. Okay, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, his hands were nailed, right? And then his feet. So if you draw these together, get the Star of David. Isn't that cool? 
I think I've shown y'all this before, but I just wanted to show that to you really quick. Okay, anyway, continuing on. No, we don't want to print the layout. What? No, stop. Okay, we are finished with this one, so we can go to the next one. All right, Exodus 13, the firstborn consecrated. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. The feast of unleavened bread. And Moses said to the people, oh, stop it. Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. On this day you are going out in the month of Abib, and it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which you swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came out from Egypt. It shall be as a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year, the law of the firstborn. And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and gives it to you, that you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb. That is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the male shall be the Lord's. But every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then, then you shall break its neck. Oh, I don't like that. <laughs> and all the I'm such an animal lover, though. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. So it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this that you shall say to him? By strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I go, therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a sign on your hand and as frontlets between your eyes. For by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, the wilderness way. Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines. Although that was near, for God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. So they took their journey from Sukkoth and camped in Etham at the, at the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So as to go by day and night, he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Okay, so that's the end of that part. And then I have Matthew 16 from To Be Like Christ. Yeah. Three. Okay. Let me just want to say, oh, my jacket's right behind me. Get a little chilly in here. Temperature must be dropping. One of our cats, CB, the one that I made go outside yesterday because he potted in my closet because he just being defiant little turd. He just doesn't want to come in now. And he's going to hate it. If it gets too cold out there, I'm going to make him come in. But, you know, our neighbor's cat is outside all the time. And our neighbor has not trapped him again. I mean, he already trapped one of their cats, and that's when he got his trap beat to a little tiny piece so maybe Adam has learned his lesson not to be trapping people's cats because that's two neighbors now that have like was ready to beat him down you know because they're not believers they were ready to put him in the hospital for trapping their cats you know or whatever so 
we're thinking maybe, maybe we'll just let them out and just kind of watch them, you know, really, really close. I'll probably go outside and do like a live stream daily bread or something so that they'll know I'm outside watching my cats. Anyway, Matthew 16, verses 1 through 4, because these cats have got to get some outside time. They're about to drive us up the wall. We're about ready to lose our mind, seriously. Anyway, Matthew 1, <laughs> 1 through 4, And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Pay attention to this part. Because this is exactly why I don't understand why only 3% of the churches are preparing God's flock for the times that we're in. The end time signs that are just obvious. The, the Bible prophecies that are being fulfilled right before our eyes, you know. And and why no one is, is why is so few pastors want to teach on this? You know, they just teach on certain subjects, and that's it. You know, I, the church I attend, I love this church because they teach the whole Bible. The whole Bible. So, it's all good. Anyway, verses 1 through 4. But see, here, he's getting ready to get on to these Pharisees and Sadducees because they could, they could see signs of the sky and know if the weather is bad or whatever. But they couldn't see the signs, the fact that the Messiah that they read about in Micah and other, other uh, uh, prophets, was in their face talking to them and said so we don't want to make that same mistake because he, he jesus told us what things to look for and he told the disciples but he's telling us too because we have the word right so yeah he answered them when is evening you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red and in the morning it will be stormy today for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. You might be worried right now that you've already studied this chapter. Don't worry, you aren't the crazy one. It's the Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisees and, and scribes already approached Jesus with this exact question four chapters ago. Chapter 12, verses 38 and 39. As in that text, Jesus responds to them the same way. No sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days. Jesus would be in the heart of the earth three days before resurrecting. In between their request and this answer, two things happen. Jesus commends their meteorology skills. They were able to look up at the sky in the evening and determine the weather the next morning. If the sky were red when the sun was going down, they knew fair weather would meet them in the morning. If the sky was red in the morning, they predicted storms. This old adage had passed down to us in rhyme. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Red sky in the morning, sailor's warning. Oh, I've never heard that before, but that's cool. Jesus condemns them for their inability to interpret spiritual signs. They could predict the weather based on the way the sky presented, but they failed to accurately predict what God was doing in their world. The Pharisees and Sadducees didn't need another sign. They had already probably witnessed hundreds, if not thousands, of healings. If they knew the scriptures half as well as they claimed, they would have seen the evidence of fulfilled prophecy all around them. A flood of evidence was in front of them. Their unbelief was, as a, was a result of having ears that wouldn't hear and eyes that wouldn't see, not a result of insufficient evidence. Jesus' comment in verse 4 is very similar to his condemnation in chapters 12, verses 39 and 40. In that context, the Pharisees came asking for a sign. There, Jesus also called them an adulterous generation. There, uh, they were only to receive the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days. Jesus would be in the tomb three days. It was clear at this point that no additional sign would convince the Pharisees and Sadducees. The resurrection would provide them with all the proof they needed to believe Jesus was the Christ. Jesus would not oblige them further, especially having a perfect understanding of their impure motives. 
The fact that the Pharisees and Sadducees teamed up to take G down Jesus is significant. These two groups were not friendly. They were enemies. Their solidarity indicates how worried they were about this new teacher from Galilee. As the old saying goes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Matthew, or verses 5 through 11. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began discussing it among themselves, saying, We brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, Oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves for the five thousand and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the four thousand and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you failed to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Verse 12. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Verse 5 and 6. Rather than cast pearls before swine, Jesus departs and goes to the other side of the sea. Apparently, the apostles had forgotten to bring food along with them. This seems like a very human thing to do. Jesus uses it as an opportunity to teach. The application? We often find it difficult to bring up spiritual conversation with friends or non-believers. Well, that's true. Jesus used the occurrences of the everyday. The things people had on their mind, had their, the things people had their mind on, to segue into spiritual discussion. In order to do that, our minds need to be looking beyond the physical and into the spiritual. Jesus tells them, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. As in chapter 10, we see the word beware. The apostles are not to fear the Pharisees and Sadducees, but they are to be aware of their influence. This may seem like a the statement to modern Bible readers, but it is important to put yourself in a first century Jewish context. Many of the Jews likely respected the Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees. And go. And go. They may have read to them in their synagogues on Sabbath. The Jews probably went to them with questions of the law. They may have believed them to be honorable and godly men. Uh, I probably would have assumed that too. They may have believed, uh, I mean, and only in Jesus were they beginning to see that they had been misled and misguided by individuals who perhaps didn't know God as well as they had believed. See that right there? That is a perfect example of why our pastors are a tool right they teach us but they're also human right so we we need to do you know we are, they are simply a tool that we use to study the word right but we still need to get the final word from god in his word the physical word of god and let god speak to us through his word because like i was saying about for instance the sinner's prayer for instance that's something that's been taught generation after generation after generation after generation in certain Baptist churches, for instance, right? Not bashing the Baptist. I've attended many Baptist churches. In fact, I've probably attended more Baptists than anything else, to be honest. Somehow, I always end up in a Baptist church. I don't know why, but I just did. Uh, and it was always, okay, pray this prayer with me. Repeat after me. Say these words. Okay, you're saved, right? And that's because that's what we were always taught, right? I was always taught that the un there was two unforgivable sins, blaspheming the Holy Spirit and committing suicide. There's only one unforgivable sin, and that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So, just, you know, the, your pa I'm not talking about my pastors. I'm not talking about any particular pastors. And it's, it's just a sad day. And I'm not talking about my church right now, but it's just sad that you have to confirm and you clarify these things. I'm not talking about anyone in particular. I'm going to say this, but there are some that teach what their dad taught and what their dad's dad taught and what their dad's dad's dad taught and what they've been teaching all these decades and generation after generation, because that's what they've always been taught. But then after so many generations, you realize that actually the sinner's prayer, that's not even biblical. 
You can't tell the person what to repent of and what to pray to God to get saved. That has to come from their heart. That has to come from them. That's between them and God, right? So, you know, they may have believed them to be honorable and godly men, which, of course, our pastors are godly. Of course, they're godly men. Of course. Absolutely. But they're beginning to see that, you know, that they may not know everything. You know what I'm saying? They could have been misled. They could have been taught wrong doctrine because their dad taught that doctrine. And then their dad's dad taught that doctrine and so forth and so on. You know, it's just, it's it's possible. I'm not saying it is happening, but everywhere, but it, it's possible. And so this is why you don't just take the word of one person. You just don't take the word of your pastor as gospel. That's it. That's what it is, period. No, no, you research, you search it out, you pray about it, you ask God for discernment, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, wisdom, knowledge, discernment, and understanding, wisdom, knowledge, discernment, and understanding, pray about it, ask and ask and ask, continually ask him to open your eyes and open your ears so that when you read his word, it just is just obvious to you what he's saying, that you can understand what he's saying, that he'll speak to you through his word, and that you'll, you'll get it, right? Now, if you read something and you feel like God is impressing on your heart that it's saying something different than, say, what Pastor Ken taught, then you go to Pastor Ken and say, you know, I was reading the scripture and this is what you taught, but this is what I was feeling like God was telling me. And you can discuss it with them, right? And and he, with his wisdom, can say, well, yeah, I mean, that's a good point, but. And then y'all can discuss it. And so that way he can help you discern if that was really God speaking to you or if that was a little minion of the devil talking smack in your ear and trying to mislead you. You know what I'm saying? Because they will whisper stuff in your ear to try to get, you know, so you have to test the spirits too. So keep that in mind as well. So yeah, all that good stuff. So that's, that's, I like that he said that, but I'm not saying that, that all pastors are going to, you know, that are wrong. I mean, I, I've followed many pastors and and I, I a lot of them, I take everything they say is because they've been doing it for a long time. And especially and, and it's funny, before I even started attending the church I'm at now, I was already following two pastors from two other Calvary churches. Calvary Chapel churches, I mean, even before the Jesus Revolution movie came out. And then after the movie came out, we saw the movie and then we started attending this church because it was listed on the map locator from uh, Brandon Holt House for like remnant churches, people that teach the whole word of God, not just certain topics. You know what I mean? They teach the whole Bible. And so that's what led us there. And then after we started going, I realized, oh, wait, this is a cow. Oh, 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 hey. Hey, it's the same kind of church as Jack Hibbs and 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 J.D. Farag and, and uh, James Cadiz, the two in California and one in Hawaii. I was like, wow, this is the church Chuck Smith from the movie. Wow. Yeah, it's awesome. See, the awesome how God works. Yeah, so we knew we were home. We knew we were home and all that hit. Yeah, but anyways, let me continue. I'm just dragging this way too far out. Sorry. So to help understand this better, think of how difficult it can be to get a long-standing member of a church, say the Mormon church, to see they've been misled, right? They trust their leaders. They believe their leaders are guiding them correctly. And it isn't easy for them to relinquish their confidence in those leaders, even when shown the truth about God. I have family that's Mormon, and boy, do we fight about the hut. Yeah. I don't even go down that road. The Jewish religious hierarchy has, has significant pull with the people, as we've seen the events of the crucifixion when they turned the people against Christ. Well, they turned people against Jesus, but a lot of the people turned against Jesus because they honestly thought that he was going to save them from the Romans, because that's what the Pharisees had taught them, was that the Messiah was going to be this militant person that was going to come and save them from their oppressors. And they thought that this is what Jesus was when their king came riding in on the donkey as it was foretold by a pro, you know, Bible, by a prophet in, in uh, was it, oh gosh, was it Jeremiah? 
it was either Jeremiah, Ezekiel, or Isaiah. I can't remember which one it was. Oh, gosh, I don't remember which scripture it was that talks about, it. behold, your king rides in on a donkey. I can't remember right now, but one of those prophets, anyway. I don't remember. I'm going to have to look that up. But, yeah, anyways, and they realized that he's he's not saving them, and so that's why a lot of them turned on him. Because, they're like, you were supposed to save us from these guys, and you're not doing it. You're like, not doing it. You even saved the servant's life of that centurion so, uh, Roman soldier or whatever, you know. You're friends with them. So, yeah, they, of course, Pharisees and Sadducees didn't help, I'm sure. But we've already discussed how the Pharisees had clout with the common people and the Sadducees cultivated friendship with the Romans, right? Now, you also have to keep another thing in, in mind, too. They knew that if they went against the, the Pharisees or the Sadducees, they would be kicked out of the synagogues and they wouldn't be allowed to enter the synagogue. So they didn't want that either. It's just like the guy that was blind when Jesus put the mud on his eyes and said, go wash your eyes in the pool of Salaam, I think it was, something like that. I think it was that guy. And then they brought him in and then they brought his parents in and the mom was like, he's old enough. Ask him because they didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to have any mom didn't want to have to answer anything because she didn't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. And the guy finally is like, you know, maybe, you know, he said whatever he said and they kicked him out of the synagogue after that. But I think he started following Jesus anyway, so it didn't matter. But that's another reason why a lot of them turned against Jesus because they cared more about being able to attend the synagogue, sadly. So, you know, that's that's probably probably a part of it. I don't know that for a fact, but I'm just kind of guessing from by what he's saying here. Anyway, continuing, verse 7 through 12. The apostles don't understand Jesus' statement and assume it has something to do with their neglect of bringing bread to eat. I probably would have thought the same thing. Jesus aware of this, I would be afraid to even think about uh, th I would be afraid to even think around Jesus. Well, heck, yeah, because he's God. He knows, he knew what we were going to think before we even thought it. Come on. <laughs> Could you imagine being his brothers and sisters growing up? You know, because you know how your brother do something, make you mad, and you'd be sitting there, and you'd be thinking these thoughts. And, and, and Jesus would be looking at Mary going, Mary, or mom, mother. Will you tell Jude to quit saying this and, you know, he quit saying this in his mind? Could you just imagine? That's a joke. That's a terrible joke. But I've heard people say that, talk about that. Could you imagine? How was it? It's a comedian. This is a, a Christian comedian that does stand up. And he was talking about, could you imagine, uh, talking about how Jesus is being a show off, uh, walking on water and stuff <laughs> at the pool and stuff like that. Uh, anyway, okay, I'll continue. Sorry. You, just have, you have to laugh to keep from crying sometimes. So, anyways, I'm trying to get this to go to the next page. There it goes. Okay, so the application is we are no further separated from Jesus than the apostles were here. What is in our minds is no more secret from Christ than the apostles' thoughts. All right? If Jesus sat next to me on the couch, would he be pleased with the direction of my mind? A lot of times, probably not at all. Yeah. I find it helpful to imagine Jesus physically with me to guard myself. Well, he lives in us. If we're saved, he lives in us. The Holy Spirit resides in us. So, yeah. To guard myself against the illusion that everything is not visible to him. I know it's often used as a joke, but the question, would Jesus be happy if he saw you doing that, is beneficial in grounding us in reality. Oh, that's true. Reality is God is always with us on the couch, in our car, in the bathroom, at work, when we travel. Mm -hmm. Yep. To not realize and live in that reality is to be out of touch with reality. Jesus says their lack of recognition of his true intention was due to them lacking faith. They needed a mind more tuned to spiritual teaching. Jesus wasn't concerned with the fact they didn't have any bread. He asked them if they remembered when he fed 5,000 men and had leftovers. He then asked them if they remembered when he fed 4,000 with just seven loaves of bread. Even the devil knew he would turn stones to bread. Well, Jesus wanted them to be aware of the influence and teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees. While the Pharisees sounded good and probably used scripture when they spoke, 
they were misguiding people and making it difficult for people to know God. So, uh, Brandon Holt House and this guy named Lee Brainerd. I was watching a video they did to, uh, today. I was watching the rest of it today. Um, they were talking about how some, he was watching a, a female evangelist, I don't know, her, or a pastor or whatever she was. Um, and he said 90% of what she taught was true, but 10% of it was wrong. Like talking about we're all firstborn, we're all first fruits, I mean. Yeah, which goes along with that word of faith movement that they were doing for a while there, talking about we're little gods and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Phew. So, you know, just. If, if it was a, a, a fairly new Christian and it was just an honest, innocent mistake, that's one thing. But this person had decades under their belt of being in the word and had like degrees in theology in the thing, right? So they knew what they were doing. And that's how Satan works. He takes enough truth to where you honestly think that they're telling you the truth, teaching you the true word of God, and they put just enough lie in it to make it dangerous. Yeah. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. That's why you should always, 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 always read your Bible so that you can compare it to what you're being taught and ask God for wisdom, knowledge, discernment, and understanding so that you'll know that you know that you know that what you're being taught and what you're reading in the word and what God is revealing to you when you read his word and what he speaks to your heart when you're reading his word that it lines up. Because God will reveal it to you if you ask him. He loves, he loves to share with us. He loves to show us things. He loves to talk to us through his word, his living word. He loves to help us to understand what we're reading because that's how he talks to us. Amen. While the Pharisee, okay, so remember even the devil can quote a scripture because he did. Remember when he was talking about, you know, Throw yourself down. Angels won't even let you dash your foot against a rock. They'll lift you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. I think is how I put it. That is part of the reason bad teachers can be so convincing. They use a credible source and twist its meaning. They rely on the reputation of the Bible but then misinterpret it. Many are deceived because they don't do the research for themselves. He is just saying what I just said. Bless you, Luke Taylor. Thank you for saying that. Ooh, yes. Fake news spreads the same way. It cites some credible sounding organization or research. There are some threads of truth in it that make it sound legitimate, but then twist facts to spin the information. Its viability depends on people not doing their own research. Leaven is an influential ingredient, as seen in chapter 13. One small pinch of leaven can make all the difference in a loaf of bread. In the same way, a small bit of influence could have huge effects on a group of people. Uh, just real quick, I know this is turning into a very long video, but uh, and so I was watching a video today where this guy was doing a social experiment and he was going to this campus and he was all asking college students, which do you would you prefer the, our country to be, socialist or capitalist? Which do you prefer, socialism or capitalism? And most of them were like socialism, you know, because, you know, socialist countries, they don't have to pay uh, for health care. They have free health care and they have free uh, education. He says, OK, OK, so let's say that we, we become a socialist country. He says, so then you wouldn't have a problem with sharing your GPA score with someone that maybe doesn't have a very good GPA, someone that doesn't really want to study or do the homework that has a low GPA, but needs a higher GPA so they can pass and get their degree. So you wouldn't mind sharing your GPA score with them. And they're like, well, no, that's not the same. He says, well, that's exactly the same as someone that works and has to share their money with someone that doesn't want to work. He goes, well, no, because with my GPA score is high because I work really hard and I spend a lot of hours working hard studying to bring that score to make it high like that because I work really hard to get it there. 
And he says, yeah. And a lot of people work really, really hard to earn that hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars that they have accumulated. They work really hard and work a lot of hours to get that money, but yet they're expected to share it with other people that don't want to work. They don't want to put in the time or the effort to work. They just want someone to share what they have with them. So everyone has equal amounts. So it is exactly the same. So this person over here that doesn't want to study or do their homework, they want you to do all the work and share your GPA score with them so they can still get their degree and pass. Maybe not with a as good a grade as, you know, you know, that they should probably have if they were to actually put forth an effort, but they would pass and they'd get their degree and they wouldn't have to do the work. You'd do it for them because socialist country, they would just share your GPA score with them. Same thing. There you go. See, they, a small bit of influence can have huge effects on group of people. They don't understand the full repercussions of what socialism actually means. They don't get it. They don't get it. Because see, there's a there's a little video I saw that it was uh, actually it was a uh, Ronald Reagan. It was a cartoon like video talking to to Obama, right? This is years ago when Obama was in office, and he says, okay, so let's say there's a classroom, and everyone takes a test, and you have like three or four students that are straight A students that study really 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 hard. And they ace the test, but the, and then there's like three or four students that like maybe made a B on it or a C, and then there's like three or four students that fell, flunked it, just failed it straight up. He says, and so the next week they took another test, and so the teacher said, okay, well since some of you, most of y'all failed, we're going to grade on a curve. So those that worked really really hard and made a, a, an A, it actually dropped down to like an A minus. And it kind of brought their grade down because they had, because of the people that failed, it put it on a curve. So it brought their score down, even though they worked really hard to score a perfect score on their test. So the next week they had another test. So those that had studied really, really hard, they did again. But those that made the B or the C on their test, they didn't really study as hard because they figured mm, the A's got it. They, the, the A's students have it. And of course, those that didn't study before didn't study again. And so this time, even more people failed and more people got low. The B's and C's got more like C's and D's. More people failed. And the A's, they she did the curve again and it jerked all those A students' grades down to B's. And so the A students were like mad. And so the next week when they took another test, the A students were like, well, I'm not going to keep studying and bringing their grades up. It's bringing my grades down. Why should I be doing all the work? So they stopped studying. They didn't do the homework. They didn't study. They didn't do any of that. So then everyone failed. Because once they stopped doing all the work, then no one was getting anything. Because they were tired of doing all the work and everyone else was getting the benefit of them working and they weren't having to do anything, but they were getting the benefit of what the A students were getting. The A students were doing all the work and these people that didn't want to do the homework or study were getting the benefits sitting on their butt, not doing anything. And that's exactly what socialism is. But see, they don't, they don't teach them all of that. They just teach them just enough about it to make it look like, yeah, free health care and free this. It's great. That's exactly what that is referring right there. That, that's an example of it right there. Anyways, going on, verse 13 and 14. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus and his apostles depart. What? Hold on. Did he just jump that far, really? Hold on. Hmm. Okay, that's kind of weird. Jesus and his apostles depart Galilee and travel northeast to Caesarea. Philippi. He asked his apostles, who do people say that the Son of Man is? He was basically asking them for the word on the street as to his true identity. He didn't ask this because he wasn't aware of what people were saying about him, but because he was leading them to a more important question. 
The apostles responded, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, some say one of the prophets. As we've observed in other chapters, it seems the Jews were anticipating a return of some of the old dead prophets with the coming of the Messiah. It seems some believed Elijah would make a physical appearance as the forerunner of Christ. Verse 15 and 16, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. After providing their knowledge of public opinion, they're asked what they believe about the identity of Jesus. The application, is there a more important question? This question will make all the difference in our lives and in eternity. If Jesus is our savior, we will live under his lordship. If he isn't, we won't. If we acknowledge Jesus as our savior, he will acknowledge us before the father. If we don't, he won't. Can you give a real answer to this question? Peter had been with Jesus for a long time now and had considered the evidence. Have you considered the evidence? Do you know Jesus yourself? Or can you only provide an answer provided by the popular opinion? Is your opinion of Jesus based off of your own research and study? Or is it just a compilation, 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 bleh, of things you've heard <laughs> from other people? If you can't give an honest, researched answer about the identity of Christ, I mean of Jesus, I, I don't criticize you. In fact, I commend you for participating in this study to discover the real Christ for yourself. There are a lot of people in this world that will tell you about Jesus, but very few of them have put in the time to read about him, consider his teachings, and learn his true identity for themselves. It is Peter, the bold apostles who met Jesus walking on the water, who responded with his conclusion, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This confession of faith has been a pillar of Christian faith since Peter first uttered it. Jesus is the anointed son of God. I believe that's what Christ means, the anointed one. Verses 17 through 19. Bella, you're so silly. You're so silly, girl. And Jesus answered him, <laughs> don't poke her in the eye, Toby. <laughs> Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood is not, don't, don't, Toby, uh -uh. don't you dare do that to her. You're going to hurt her like that. Sorry if I did that in your ear. But she's underneath this uh, shelf of this computer desk, and he was going to try to grab her by the back of her neck. Oh, it's 11-11. And pull her out by the hair on the back of her neck. Oh, beat him down. Sorry. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus commends Peter for his confession. Bar Jonah means son of Jonah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like I'm Debbie Bat Elsie. Because my mama's name is Elsie. Or Debbie Bat Bill. Bat William. Because actually my dad's first name was William. But he went by Bill. But males are bar and women, females are bat. That's why m m boys, the guys have bar mitzvahs and the girls have bat mitzvahs. Yeah, anyway, just a little Jewish education there. Bar Jonah means son of Jonah and may be used here to contrast Simon, the son of a man, to Jesus, the son of God. I feel like there is still Jesus was Jesus bar Joseph, technically. That's what they called him on earth. I feel like there's more to Jesus' title, Son of Man, than I grasp, but I'm not just not sure what I'm missing. Well, I know that mankind is the sons of men, right? Because we're sons of men. But Jesus being the title Son of Man is what the Messiah is called, Son of Man. I know that. Uh, I remember studying that a while back. Uh, but, uh, man, it's been a minute. It's been a smooth minute. So I'm going to have to find my notes on that. And uh, if when I find it, I'll probably forget. But 
I'll try to find that. But yeah, I, I remember that. That's why he referred, because when he refers to himself as the son of man, that's why they're saying blasphemy, because he was, he was basically calling himself the son of God. And as he says, did he not say that we're all sons of God? You know, but you know, this, that's that one verse that scripture that a lot of these word of faith movement pastors would get twisted trying to say we were little gods no that's not what he was talking about but i digress so anyways but that jesus i feel like there's more to jesus title son of man than i grasp but i'm just not sure what i'm missing this is what luke taylor's saying but i do know that by calling himself son of man he is professing that he is the messiah by saying that Having a better understanding of that title may illuminate this passage further. Man, it's going to bug me. Uh, let me look up the scripture super quick. Um, uh, oh, where's my phone? Not got it. I know. I can't believe he doesn't know this. That's that's a trip. Okay, give me just a second because this is like common knowledge. Okay. What was the significance of Jesus calling himself the son of man? So the Bible wants to emphasize that he is fully human. So that's the common understanding. He is both divine and he is human. Two natures, one person. Okay, that's not what I've heard. His authority is for the purpose of leading others. Jesus being the son of man means that he is a leader of mankind. Okay, that's getting closer. Uh, in the Old Testament, as a synonym for man, the book of Daniel uses it to refer to the coming divine ruler who will be given authority and a kingdom by God. There it is. Bam. Snap. And that's why he says son of man, not son of men. We're sons of men, sons and daughters of men, men. He is the son of man, meaning the leader of mankind. He is the ruler of all, the divine ruler. Amen. Anyway, I should, I should, I should go to this video, this thing and, and comment on his video and tell him that, but I'm not. Anyways, Peter had come to this realization by Listen to the words and observing the revelations of God, not by human wisdom. Human wisdom led to the rejection of Jesus. The Jewish elite in their human wisdom, quotation marks, had come to a different conclusion when examining Jesus. Peter, with ears to hear, had listened to God and accepted Christ as the Messiah. Peter was open to being taught by God and God had revealed the Son. Matthew eleven twenty-seven, 27. Verse 18. Fun fact, the word for church, ecclesia, is used in 112 verses in the New Testament. Do you know how many times Jesus uses it? Twice. Two times. This verse deserves our attention due to the way it's been interpreted and misunderstood by many. The identity of Christ has already been made clear in this text, but now we must clarify the identity of the rock. Give me just one second, guys. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, so uh, where were we? Rather than jumping headfirst into an evaluation of what this verse doesn't say and, and how it has been abused, we want to evaluate Jesus' words for what they are. I want to present three possibilities for the identity of the rock. And we're not talking about Dwayne Johnson, just so you'll know. So no. 
we cannot smell what the rock is cooking. This interpretation assumes the unstated gesture of Christ, but it has biblical reason for doing so. The church is built on Christ, and he is the cornerstone. Oh, I was just getting ready to say that. Ah, oh, awesome, Luke Taylor. And he is the cornerstone, the first stone of a foundation, the cornerstone that was rejected. Amen. First Corinthians, or is that first? Ah, I think that's first Corinthians. Pretty sure. Yeah, of course it is. What am I thinking? Mm. Yeah, First Corinthians 3.11. For knowing to lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Acts 4.11. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Again, this interpretation requires an assumption, but I believe it to be a reasonable assumption. The rock is Peter. Some look at this verse and assume Jesus turned to the other apostles and gestured back to Peter. In this interpretation, the text should be understood as follows. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. Jesus turning to address his other apostles while pointing at Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Admittedly, this is not my favorite interpretation, but I want to explore it for reasons I will make it plain later. If this interpretation is taken, Peter is the rock, or at least one rock, on which Christ will build his church. Is such an interpretation consistent with the rest of the scriptures? The case can be made that Peter was part of the foundation on which the church was built and even played a unique role in the process. Well, his house was the location of the first church. I know that. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Peter was the first to make this powerful profession of faith and was the first to be identified by Christ as part of the church's foundation. It was upon men such as this that Christ would build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Satan had already attempted to thwart Jesus's mission in the wilderness in Matthew 12. He attempted further through the veil or through the evil <laughs> of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Satan did everything he could to stop the eternal plan of God, but it was not to be stopped. Not even the death of Savior could stop God's power. Satan's still trying to stop the second return of Jesus. Why do you think everyone's coming against the Jews now? Why do you think everyone wants to genocide from the river to the sea? Palestine will be free. Why do you think they want to kill all the Jews? Just saying. I have news for him. From the river to the sea, Palestine will not be free because that's God's land. That's that's that belongs to God. He gave it to his chosen, and no one's gonna take it from them. I have news. He, Jerusalem will come become a cup of trembling. And anyone that comes against Jerusalem, God's gonna mess their world up. Just saying. But anyway, let me go on back to this. Satan had already attempted, okay, he attempted further through the evil of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Satan did everything he could to stop the eternal plan of God, but it was not to be stopped. Not even the death of our Savior could stop God's power. The gates of hell could not hold Jesus' body in the grave. Because, see, Jesus was God in the flesh. That's how he was able to lay down his life and take it up again. Jesus said, no one, no one can take my life. I can lay my life down and take it up again. And that's exactly what he did because he was God in the flesh. Mm. That is how he defeated death in the grave and took back the keys to hell and Hades. Three days after quenching the power of sin with his blood on the cross, Jesus demolished Satan's second great weapon, death, through his resurrection. The gates of hell wouldn't keep the gates of heaven from opening. Verse 19. In verse 18, the question was, what is the rock? In verse 19, the question is, to whom are the keys given? Before we explore that question, let's understand the concept of keys, binding, and loosing. Keys. 
What are keys? Keys unlock doors. Simple, right? Binding and loosing. Jesus here appears to be telling the apostles they would have the ability to speak with authority about what would be permitted or forbidden in the New Covenant Church. This can sound a bit strange, like the apostles had the liberty to make up any rules they wanted when they were leading the church. But don't forget, the apostles were being guided by the Holy Spirit and had divine direction. Whatever they were binding or loosing on earth would have had the approval from heaven. We know that this power was promised to all of the apostles, not just Peter. In Matthew 18, Jesus makes an almost identical statement while addressing all of his apostles. In uh, Matthew 18, 18, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now back to our question, to whom are the keys given? Let's look at two interpretations. The keys are given to the apostles in general. The keys here refer to the keys to open the doors to the church. The kingdom of heaven was at hand, coming soon, and the apostles would have the privilege of opening the doors in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2. In addition, they would have many other doors to open as the gospel was taken to the world for the first time. The keys are given to Peter specifically. Some suggest that they, these keys, that the keys are Peter's and are given as a blessing for his bold profession. Peter was given a unique role in the early church. The text of Acts 2 seems to indicate that Peter was given the lead role, at least initially, on the day of Pentecost when the doors of the kingdom of heaven were officially opened to the Jews. God also selected Peter to open the door of the church to the Gentiles when he was sent to Cornelius' house in Acts 10. So the case can certainly be made that Peter was given an exclusive role in the new church and was given keys for opening doors that no one else possessed. The Catholic interpretation, I have refrained up till now with some difficulty for mentioning the Catholic interpretation of this verse. I did this so that we could honestly evaluate the words as they appear in context without building interpretations off knee-jerk reactionary theology. However, I believe it is important to address the Catholic Church's misuse of this text. You can get some help, Toby. You got it, baby? Okay. Poor baby. Oive. The Catholic Church uses this verse as a foundational pillar of papal authority. They believe Peter was made the leader of the Lord's Church on earth. From Peter, there has been a continual line of papal leaders up to the present day. The Pope's position is presented by the keys, alluding to verse 18. So that's what that's about. Okay. We do not have time to flesh out all of the details of papal authority. Let me give a very brief and probably oversimplified statement about the Catholic doctrine. My simple explanation. Now, this is Luke Taylor talking. I haven't studied enough about the Catholic religion. So this is him. My simple explanation. The Catholic Church teaches Peter was the leader of the church, was superior in authority to all other early church leaders, and that Peter's position was intended by God to be filled by an appointed man in every generation. What? 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 I'm sorry. We took a look at three interpretations of the rock and explained them biblically. We took a look at two interpretations of the recipient of the keys and explained them biblically. It's important to understand and see that no interpretation of this text will justify the conclusions of the Catholic position. Even if one takes the position that Peter is the rock to which Jesus was referring, the Bible still won't lead us to a pope. Well, I'm sorry, and I'm not going to bash the Catholic religion, but the fact that they call the pope. Holy Father, and we're not to call anyone on earth Father, because there's only one Holy Father, and that's God, for starters. The fact that they pray to Mother Mary for intercessory prayer, that's two. Need I carry on? I need not. 
I've made my point. In fact, after the first 10 chapters in Acts, we do not see Peter being evaluated or elevated above his companions. If anything, we see the opposite. Peter does not lead doctrinal discussions on circumcision at the Council of Jerusalem. James does, Acts 15. In Galatians 2, Paul rebukes Peter for mistreating fellow Christians. In Peter's own epistle, in 2 Peter 3.16, Peter admits that some of the things Paul writes about are hard to understand. Strange things to say if you are the leader of the church. The New Testament writers, nor Peter himself ever, mention his exclusive rank or position of authority. If anyone had a had it, I would think it would have been Paul over Peter, to be quite honest. The only way you reach the conclusion a pope should oversee your church is to bring a massive amount of theological, doctrinal, and traditional baggage with you to Matthew 16, 18. This is a great example of why we must read the Bible comprehensively. And this is a great example of what I was talking about, where well, you should read it for yourself, you should study it for yourself, you should research it for yourself. And because just because they taught it for decades and now your dad's 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 dad taught it doesn't mean it's right. Just saying. It is also an important lesson on why we need to read the Bible for ourselves and check whether the information we are being fed is accurate. Bam. Bam. 100% bam. There are billions of Catholics around the world being fed. This verse is proof of Pope Francis's authority. Pope Francis doesn't even claim to be a Christian. I don't know what he claims to be, but he's sure it for God. He ain't for our God. I don't know. I don't know what he is trying to say. We all serve. The, we all worship the same God. The heck we do. The heck we do. <laughs> oh, I would encourage them to grab a Bible for themselves, but they have their own Bible. They have their own Bible. And check the truth of what they're being taught. The Jewish leaders likely told all the people that the Messiah was going to look a certain way. Yeah, he was going to be a militant leader. But if they had searched the scriptures for themselves, they would have found the Messiah to be misrepresented. Micah. Isn't it Micah 2? Was it Micah 2.5 or 5.2? I always get that backwards. Where it talks about being a small root. Being the smallest among them. Something of that nature. Uh, it's Malachi. No, Malachi. Like Micah. Toby, leave her alone. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you be little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of you shall he come forth unto me, who is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. That's Micah 5.2. I mean, uh, yeah, 5.2. Yeah. 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 That doesn't sound like a smallest among, doesn't sound like, doesn't sound like a militant man to me. Sounds like a baby. From that time, Jesus began to show us this. Um, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. From the elders and chief priests, the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Verse 22 and 23. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And, and the New King James Version, I think it says, instead of a hindrance, it says, You are a stumbling block. Right? Verse 21, from the time of Peter's confession and on, Jesus started explaining his purpose on earth. He was to be the sacrificial lamb for the sins of the world. This required him to go to Jerusalem. Another thing, why are the Catholics wearing crosses that show Jesus still on the cross? He's not still on the cross. In fact, God even gave me a song. He's not still on the cross. You know, I mean, it's, it's just like part of it. Yeah. But I have like a whole song that but that's what it's called is he's not still on the cross. But anyway, never mind. Anyway, 
He was to be the sacrificial lamb for the sins of the world. This required him to go to Jerusalem, be abused in the courts, die, raise in three days, or rise in three days. In verse 22, evidently Peter didn't like the idea of the Messiah. He just confessed being killed by his religious enemies. He took Jesus aside and rebuked him, saying, this shall never happen to you. The apostles didn't understand Jesus' role as a sacrificial lamb, and in their minds, Jesus being killed was the worst thing in the world. You notice how no one seemed to be curious about the resurrection part of Jesus' prophecy? They seemed to have stopped listening at the part about him dying on account of their outrage. How could the apostles have been so shocked when Jesus was killed and resurrected? I think this goes to show the power of expectational filters. Oh, okay. That just looked weird. I thought you fell. Okay. Uh... How difficult is it for someone to change their mind when they approach a situation already believing they know what to expect? The apostles apparently had an idea about who the Christ was going to be, and death wasn't included in that idea. They probably got this idea from their Mosaic law teachers. Even when Jesus explained his intentions with perfect clarity, they still could not understand. The same thing can happen to us. We can approach the Bible or Christian religion with an expectation of what we're going to find. Those outside the church may have expectations about what really following Jesus looks like. Those inside the church may have expectations about what others believe and what the Bible teaches. Those ideas are probably the result of some person who informed or taught us in the past. We need to make sure we are evaluating Jesus and his church accurately. We need to be teachable. And we need to pray that God would remove our blind spots. Amen. Verse 23. Jesus' rebuke of Peter is harsh. And Peter was probably shocked. Although he wouldn't understand it until much later, Peter would eventually learn that Jesus' death was the eternal plan of God. And try to hinder Jesus' sacrifice was to participate in Satan's work. Verses 24 and 25. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This text is very similar to Jesus' statement in Matthew 10, verses 38 and 39. It reads, And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For the sake of time, I will refer you back to my comments in chapter 10. Okay. Matthew uh, verse 26 and 27. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Even if a man is extraordinarily rich while living on the earth, what good will his money do him after death? None. You can serve money your entire life, but no matter how much you accumulate, you will be of equal net worth with the world's poorest in death. More importantly than the condition of your net worth upon death is the condition of your soul. Money is meaningless to God, but the blood of his son is of significant value. No amount of paper money will redeem your soul. You can be covered in gold, but unless you're covered in the blood of Christ, your soul will not be safe. Jesus is going to return a second time and will judge all men based on how they, they have lived. Verse 28. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. There are some people that the dead and the dead in Christ will be called up first, and those that, that are alive and remain will meet them in the air. So some will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Did you know that? So some will go from this earthly vessel right to their glorified body in the twinkling of an eye, which is like, I believe it's like one four hundredth of a second or something like that. Yeah. That'd be okay. I'd be all right with that. I'd be all right. I'd be like sitting here doing the Daily Bread video and then in like one four hundredth of a second that I'm in my glorified body. I would be okay with that. That would be all right. I would love that. 
Jesus offers this encouragement to his apostles who may have been discouraged and confused about Jesus' previous teachings. Eleven of the twelve apostles, Judas being the exception, would see the church, kingdom of heaven, established during their lifetime. Jesus' teachings may have seemed difficult and abstract to them, but in a short time they would participate in bringing about God's plan for the salvation of the world. Oh, that is the last page. Okay. So that concludes uh, the daily reading for today and the light Bible study, even though I'm kind of combining. It's supposed to be just the reading, but not for the Gospels. Sorry, I'm not going to just read them. We're going to do this. And yeah, it turned out to be a long video, but I personally have enjoyed it because there's a lot of stuff I learned from his breakdown of the chapter. So Shalom. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. If any of y'all stuck in there with me for this hour and 40 minutes. Uh, God bless you. Know that I love you and Jesus loves you. And just know that Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If a man hear my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and him with me. Jesus is knocking. But he's not going to be forceful. He's a gentleman. He's just waiting for you to open the door. If you don't know him as your personal Lord and Savior, if you have not surrendered all to him, don't wait another minute because we have no promise of tomorrow. Amen. Shalom.